Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Heather Conley. I'm director of the Europe, Russia, and Eurasia program here at CSIS. And today we have a great conversation lined up for you, taking a deep dive and looking at the security challenges in the Eastern Mediterranean. Of course, there are important regional dynamics, uh, but the Eastern Mediterranean is a, a location of global importance where we see strategic competition, Russia and China's engagement. We see a strong uh, NATO looking towards its southern flank. Uh, we see strong US-Greek defense cooperation. So there is a lot to talk about, a lot to unpack. And on behalf of myself and my colleague, Rachel Elhus, we are delighted to join uh, and to conversation probably one of the best people placed to help us unpack all of these challenges in the Eastern Mediterranean. Greek Minister of National Defense, Nicholas Panagiotopoulos. Uh, the minister has been a member of the Greek parliament since 2007. He has served on a variety of very important committees in the parliament, uh, defense and foreign affairs. He served uh, as a deputy, a former deputy minister of labor in the Greek government. Uh, but we're so delighted that he could make time uh, to join us. We know he's got another uh, session in parliament to return to after our conversation. Uh, so uh, Mr. Minister, Welcome. We're so delighted that you're, that you're here. Uh, we welcome you to provide some opening framing remarks, and then Rachel and I look forward to joining you in conversation. We encourage our audience to please submit questions so we can uh, bring your questions into our conversation with the minister. So with that, Mr. Minister, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Heather. Let me first uh, express my, my joy and, and gratitude, actually, for this very kind invitation uh, on your part to have me uh, at uh, a, a participant at the Center of uh, um, International Studies and, and, and uh, share views uh, on uh, security environment in the volatile and Eastern Med region. Um, also giving me the opportunity to present uh, my country's uh, arguments uh, on how to attain a stable security environment in the Eastern Med, despite all the growing uh, instabilities, uh, challenges and threats in the region affecting a, a variety of actors, uh, I would say globally. Um, let me start uh, in, in, by making the statement that, that the Eastern Med is a region of vast, I think, strategic importance, historical strategic importance. It's not new. Um, it's always been an intersection between different continents, a connecting uh, uh, um, path between uh, uh, East and West, a, a, an area of vital strategic interest by um, the uh, reigning powers uh, throughout history, certainly a, a, a region where, where the United States has uh, always had a significant presence. Um, and I would say an, a region that should command the renewed and enhanced interest of NATO as it tries to, to address the challenges in its southern flank. Now, what is new in the region, though, is um, a series of um, as local and regional actors who are acting with uh, a newfound assertiveness, uh, sometimes uh, a revisionist. Uh, conduct, trying to uh, redraw the balance of power in the region and, and beyond that, uh, trying to redraw legal conventions or nullify sovereign rights of uh, selected coastal states. Um, uh, this is a new and actually worrying, worrisome uh, uh, development and certain, certainly a factor of uh, um, instability and, and I would say growing instability that uh, all um, stability seeking actors should address. Um, the way we read developments 
is that uh, um, is, is a certain common denominator, if you will. It's Turkey's um, expansionist, uh, revisionist, neo-Ottoman aspirations and aggressive strategic posture. Um, I, you know, whatever I, uh, whenever I engage in, 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 in uh, uh, public speaking forums or, or even bilateral contacts with friends and allies, I get this feeling that, you know, it's getting a bit trivial, trivial or, or tiresome for, for a Greek minister to once more speak about Turkey and all the existing friction and, and escalating tensions that date for centuries now. However, this time around, I think it's more serious because the overall conduct of Turkey has um, wider ramifications with respect to the security environment in the region. And it is now due to a, um, a different perception of itself, a growing perception of Turkey as a, if you allow me the term, as a regional superpower that strives to assert itself over neighboring countries and other actors in the region, but through a very aggressive strategic posture that borders uh, with a uh, um, um, direct um, um, a direct series of, of military threats and some very aggressive belligerent rhetoric that uh, has caught the attention of everybody, actually. It's no longer a bilateral thing between Greece and Turkey. It's a conduct that affects just about everybody in the wider region, Arab states, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, NATO allies, um, traditional Mediterranean powers like France and Italy, um, uh, African states like Egypt, not to mention Libya, we all know what's going on there, um, and thereby creates an unstable security environment for the whole region. Now, Greece has always been a country that abides by international law and tries to conduct itself through the norm of good neighborly relations. Um, we've always concluded our international agreements for the delimitation of our exclusive, exclusive economic zone, for example, and we've did so recently with Italy and Egypt. Uh, we agreed with Albania uh, to bring uh, this issue uh, to uh, the, before the International Court of Justice if we don't manage to resolve it um, bilaterally. What I mean from this is that we always see ourselves as, a, as stable, reliable allies within the European context, within the NATO framework, within the um, regional context that always seek to uh, resolve any differences that arise with our neighbors uh, in a peaceful, uh, law-abiding uh, manner. Unfortunately, we haven't had great access, success in, in trying to uh, uh, do this with our Turkish neighbors. We are still trying to reach an understanding that with them. However, you know, we've spent uh, uh, some uh, uh, period of, of tensions over this past summer. Actually, tensions started last March when we had a um, virtual attempt to uh, break through our borders by, let's say, a, um, a, a, a wave of, uh, of uh, uh, migrants and refugees that were actually uh, transported to our northeastern land borders and then um, uh, advised to uh, get into Greece in, uh, in a manner that, that, that resembled to us as a carefully planned hybrid type of operation. That's when the, the tension started and it, it, uh, it, uh, it lasted all the way through the summer when we had to mobilize our fleet in order to uh, um, uh, uh, take position throughout the southern Aegean and the eastern Mediterranean in order to counter the movements of the Turkish fleet, which in turn was out to escort a research vessel conducted what we um, consider as illegal research activities within our continental shelf, within our waters. Um, fortunately, the tension de-escalated finally, um, and, and we're still working uh, on ways to uh, devise deconfliction mechanisms discuss with Turkey, reach an understanding, um, get into a conversation about building confidence building measures in order to avoid 
such a situation that ultimately serves to destabilize NATO's cohesion. And that is one of the greater problems uh, in, in this whole relationship. We will continue uh, in this effort. We will try to reach an understanding. It's not uh, the easiest of tasks today, but I do believe that in order to keep a stable and coherent NATO, especially in its southeastern flank, uh, we must make sure that uh, tensions of this sort do not repeat themselves in the future. And that's the shared uh, opinion of all our friends and allies in NATO and Europe. So in order not to... Uh, uh, um, uh, to close at some point my opening statement, I would say that Greece is, uh, we consider ourselves as a net security provider, a guarantor of, uh, of peace and stability in the region, a growing ally and strategic partner of the United States of America in the region. We will be able to expand on our uh, enhanced strategic relationship, I, I believe. And in that respect, we will continue to conduct ourselves by adhering to international law, not unilateral actions, not any type of gunboat diplomacy that is deplored by all agents and, and, and uh, uh, reasonable players in the region in order to ensure that this part of the world, the Eastern Med, remains a sea of growth, stability, uh, relative security, and not and does not um, uh, uh, evolve into a sea of trouble and instability like uh, uh, which was the case in the past many times before. We must make sure that this very strategically important part of the world uh, uh, remains a stable and secure place. Mr. Minister, thank you so much for those opening remarks. And I was completely remiss in not uh, wishing you uh, and, and sending best wishes of congratulations for the Greek bicentennial, 200 uh, years. Uh, this is an important work, and I, I meant to say it in my, my welcoming remarks. So uh, congratulations. You've given us- I haven't a been able to celebrate as we would have liked because of the pandemic restrictions, of course. So, you know, even we Greeks are good at throwing impressive parties. Well, that hasn't been the case. But nevertheless, it's a very important, it's a hugely important landmark in our history, our 200 years since the uh, the, the struggle for our independence. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely. I think uh, so many things during the pandemic, we are going to have to delay uh, maybe having a bigger celebration the following year to make up for that. So thank you so much. Um, let's dig into this conversation. You've given us a lot of food for thought. And let me turn to my colleague, Rachel Elhus. Rachel is uh, the Deputy Director of the Europe Russia Eurasia Program, formerly a Principal Director for European and NATO Policy at the Defense Department, but most recently a co-author of a CSIS report, Securing U.S. Interest in the Greater Mediterranean. So Rachel has been unpacking these issues that you described uh, in her research. So Rachel, let me turn this over to you to ask the minister the first question. While I also encourage our audience, please send us your questions. We want to bring you into to the conversation. Rachel, over to you. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Mr. Minister, for those opening remarks. You certainly painted a compelling picture of all the security challenges in the Eastern Med, whether it's tensions with neighbors like Turkey, transnational challenges like migration, um, or influence of, of you know, malign actors below the threshold. So I certainly appreciate the way that Greece takes this more holistic approach to the greater med. Uh, and one of the things that I've noticed in, in terms of how Greece is dealing with this new security dynamic in the region is that you've made a very concerted effort to reach out to other regional partners, whether that's um, defense trilateral agreements with neighboring countries like Cyprus, Israel, and Egypt, or it's, it's more foreign policy outreach. Could you speak a bit more about what Greece's military contributions are to these new arrangements and what you hope to achieve through these new regional security partnerships? Thank you. Well, um, in order to uh, reach um, a, a consensus of, of what constitutes a secure and stable Eastern Med, I believe uh, it's very important to uh, engage with allies and partners and uh, at least those who share more or less um, uh, the same conviction about what constitutes a stable Eastern Med region. We've done that extensively through, through a, a, a greatly enhanced diplomatic effort because we believe that first and foremost, diplomacy and engagement with, between actors is uh, very important in order to reach a general understanding 
in the region. We've done that on various trilateral and multilateral schemes uh, with all those willing to share uh, in the same values of freedom, democracy, and a stable and secure Eastern Med. We've done that, for example, with Cyprus and Egypt on our trilateral uh, with Cyprus and Egypt. We did, we've done that with Cyprus and Israel. We've done that in conjunction with French, France, Italy, and Cyprus in a quadrilateral scheme. We do this on a bilateral scheme with the United States through our mutual defense cooperation agreement. Um, we've done this with uh, concluding uh, uh, um, agreements on uh, uh, the domain of defense cooperation with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, respectively, uh, um, and separately. Uh, I, I believe that all those, you know, Greece has a sort of special role in, 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 in the context that it has good relations with all those actors, whether they are Arab states, whether it's Israel, our European partners, our North African partners, and we can engage with each and one of them separately, and also with more than one collectively. Um, we are trying to pursue the agenda of achieving a stable and secure Eastern Med. We would like Turkey, uh, I don't want to be misunderstood on that, to become a member of these schemes. But in order for that to happen, Turkey has to comply with the rules, the rules being the force of international law, um, the uh, uh, notion of good neighborly relations, and, and a certain rhetoric that does not border on belligerent and hostile, but is more low key and, 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 and friendly. I believe that, that those would be steps in the right direction. I understand that Turkey has faces its own internal um, uh, problems, economic problems, problems political problems that compelled President Erdogan to align itself with the more hardcore nationalist elements within uh, 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 the Turkish political framework. But in order to be a reliable security providing actor in the region, I think that the first thing that one needs to do is to agree to comply by international law. Um, and to, to, to tell you the truth, within the NATO, the NATO context, we all know that the preamble of NATO's charter states that its members pledge to promote stability and well-being in the North Atlantic area. I think that it would be a good idea, given the circumstances, to make an amendment and provide for a clause where members should pledge to promote stability and well-being in the East Med area. I think that would be a step in the right direction, but I'm only joking. Nevertheless, um, multilateral schemes bring our uh, different countries together, joined by uh, shared values and a common vision on what a secure and stable Eastern Med region consists of. Thank you very much. Heather, I think back to you. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, yes, Mr. Minister, I just, just a sort of an explanation point. I think it's really important for us as we begin to understand this really, this new strategic realignment in the Eastern Mediterranean, that it is not an anti-Turkish coalition building exercise, that these are not exclusive uh, meetings, that they need to be inclusive. And I think that was a really important point. And I thank you so much for, for making that. Let I me turn, sorry, please. No, I, Turkey is a, is, is, a, is a great country. It has a certain presence in the area. Uh, and I, I don't think that the, um, our, our strategic aim is never was as isolated Turkey, but incorporating Turkey into a environment that thinks in a certain way though, that's very important. Right now it's not happening. So that's why Turkey is left out of all those multilateral schemes that seek to promote security, peace and stability in the Eastern Med. And, and, and the fact that just about everybody agrees uh, that the conduct of Turkey is not the right one right now because of its uh, revisionist um, uh, aggressive aspirations, I think uh, points exactly to what I want to say. Uh, 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 comply with the rules of international law and the door is open for uh, uh, a partnership that includes Turkey for a more secure and stable Eastman. 
Well, and I must say, some of these new alignments, as you described, uh, UAE, Egypt, France, Italy, Israel, this is a, a, a restitching, if you will, strategically of this region. It's very interesting, whether it's energy, whether it's security. So this is something, again, I think one, you wanted to be a part of uh, rather than uh, being outside of. So it's very interesting. Allow me, because we all see the emerging and enhanced presence, strategic presence of Russia, which has been NATO's traditional, let's say, foe or adversary, or even those of an emerging and more assertive China, who is gradually, very methodically, very patiently, very systematically, like everything China does, expands its strategic position, its posture in the region as well. Absolutely, and I wanna dig into that strategic competition in, in just a little bit, but I really would be, I really wanna to turn to the US-Greek defense relationship because <laughs> I think it's fair to say that it has been absolutely transformed uh, from the previous government to this government. So really building on a, a much more enduring presence. You noted the mutual defense cooperation agreement that was signed in, in 2019. So uh, we see the expansion of US forces at, at Suda Bay um, and uh, some of the uh, increased in port modernization in the port of Alexandropoli. So I would love your, your insights on where does this go from here? How does this relationship grow, particularly US presence, military presence increase? Uh, and then help us understand your own modernization plans. I mean, the list is pretty impressive. No. New fighter aircraft, frigates, uh, helicopters, new weapon systems. This is a real modernization. And how do you connect that modernization to bringing more capabilities for NATO's defense and deterrence operations? Because at the heart of it, that's really where we gain those, those collective security gains. Well, I'll try to take it one by one. Um, with respect to the... Um, uh, defense cooperation between the United States and, uh, and Greece, not to put down the previous left-wing government. Uh, the groundwork had been done since before, but right now we're in an excellent place and our aspiration is to make it even better. Uh, the United States ambassador in Greece, uh, my good friend uh, Jeffrey Pyatt, likes to say that uh, Greek-American uh, defense relationships are at an all-time high. We uh, uh, aim to improve on that. Um, there is the Mutual Defense Cooperation Agreement, which has been amended um, about two years ago, and is the, in the process of being amended, something which I believe would happen within the next couple of months during the summer, in order to bring in um, more locations or, which is, uh, most probable to happen, enhance what is happening on the selected locations that are in operation right now. What we've done is we've selected a couple of very strategic locations throughout Greece, Suda Bay, the jewel in the crown, the port of Alexandroupolis up in our northeastern border, and uh, uh, two air, air bases in central Greece where the um, flying conditions and the congested terrain are optimal for uh, um, high quality uh, training activities by helicopter crews and, and, and fighter aircrafts and invested in a common set of infrastructures on these locations. Suda Bay now is probably the only port in the Eastern Med uh, that is able to accommodate an aircraft carrier. The Dwight Eisenhower ported there about a month ago and we had the joy of visiting with the prime minister aboard the Eisenhower in Suda Bay. Um, the port of Alexandroupolis in northeastern Greece is now beginning to emerge as a transport hub for transporting NATO forces uh, toward, uh, uh, toward our northern Balkan space and the Black Sea, which is becoming, as you understand, strategically very important. Hence the growing strategic important of the port of Alexandroupolis, the 101st um, uh, uh, Brigade, Cavalry Brigade, uh, uh, transported elements uh, of, its, uh, of its force helicopters, uh, uh, heavy uh, military machinery through the port of Alexandroupolis. And I was there a week ago, along with uh, Ambassador Pyatt, in order to uh, 
see from close quarters what excellent work has been done there in order to transport the port of Alexandrupolis into a hub for uh, NATO forces. Um, that was in the context of uh, visiting uh, in order to uh, assess yet another uh, out of many common exercises that the Greek military uh, is conducting with, uh, with uh, uh, military from uh, other NATO friends and allies, and especially uh, the United States forces. So we're doing a lot on the Mutual Defense Cooperation Agreement. Uh, it, it, it solidifies our strategic relationship. I would like to think that this strategic relationship is not one shaped out of um, convenience, but out of conviction a conviction on shared values about freedom, democracy, human rights, the rule of law, uh, uh, the uh, uh, abiding by international law and being stable and reliable partners within Europe and NATO, of course. And in my mind, more than ever before, now Greece is turning into the uh, reliable ally, the anchor state that indeed satisfies uh, the United States aspirations for a stable partner in the region and a provider of regional stability as well, which is uh, very important, uh, as you can understand. And in that general context, we're also undertaking a very ambitious program of revamping our uh, uh, the entirety of our uh, armed forces. Of course, that's not easy for us because we're still working under financial constraints. So we have to spend very wisely. We've prioritized a project, uh, a very ambitious project of, um, uh, in, of, 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 of acquiring uh, high-end um, uh, weapon systems, starting with our Air Force. We have uh, uh, underway a very big problem program of revamping 84 of our F f-16s into the viper edition and that's done uh, in collaboration with lockheed martin and a local partner as a subcontractor which is our own hellenic airspace industry which is very important because it it engages our our uh, domestic uh, defense industry and we've acquired 18 rafale fighter aircraft from from france in a very let's say swift way we'll have them uh, the first ones will be operational uh, within less than one year from the beginning of negotiations, which is impressive, and especially by Greek bureaucratic standards, as you understand. Um, we've uh, we've uh, uh, still have uh, some ambitions, ambitious targets like uh, revamping our frigate fleet. We'll be seeking to acquire four new frigates. Hopefully, we'll be able to build at least two of them in our domestic shipyards and also try to revamp another four frigates from our existing fleet. Uh, and that those are the most ambitious, let's say, grand projects in the total uh, scheme of revamping our armed forces. We have acquired, we've agreed to acquire seven um, uh, uh, helicopters with uh, anti-submarine uh, capabilities that are very important for our fleet. And gradually, uh, we are uh, revamping the, our entire armed forces because we want to provide uh, a, a, a strong deterrent element against all those who threaten our seven rights, but also a strong contributor to the collective security within the NATO framework, especially in this part of the world. Uh, at the same time, we are engaging in a series of joint exercises with NATO partners all over the place. A number of them have been conducted with, uh, with elements of the United States uh, Armed Forces. Uh, I think that serves a lot into developing a certain interoperability between uh, the armed forces of different countries that see themselves as allies and partners. Um, I would say that we are extremely active these days on many fronts. I told you about the diplomatic front. And I, I told you about um, the, the, the ambitious project to revamp our armed forces and also engage with uh, allies and partners in, uh, in uh, enhancing interoperability between elements of our armed forces. So there's a lot of uh, stuff happening as far as we are concerned. You know, I'm a busy man these days. I, I have to, to uh, 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 submit all those plans to our prime minister for approval because we have 
certain aspects of it that we cannot overcome, like the financial aspect. Our capabilities are not uh, unlimited. Actually, it hasn't been long since Greece was under great financial strain. And we have to proceed very carefully according to our priorities, uh, according to our capabilities, but with conviction that we are uh, taking steps in the right direction. And, and to conclude, I, I have this feeling that this whole set of conduct uh, increases uh, Greece's value as a partner in NATO and also as a uh, acknowledged, let's say, uh, regional force in providing uh, stability and security in the in the wider region. And I think that has its own intrinsic value. Mr. Minister, you are busy. That is a robust program. And NATO is busy right now. It's about to have a very important summit. Rachel, let me turn to you to, to, to take the, the line of on NATO line of questioning over to you. Thanks, Heather, and thank Mr. Minister again. It's wonderful to hear that Greece's defense modernization priorities are so well aligned with the NATO requirements. Um, you know, earlier you spoke about the preamble of the North Atlantic Treaty, and I wanted to return to that because I think that will be a big focus at the June summit and potentially in, in, a, in a new strategic concept if indeed uh, heads of state and government decide to launch that at the summit. You know, we are seeing. Um, renewed internal strains in the alliance, democratic backsliding among a number of member states. But the one thing that I think is new is a linkage between these internal challenges and external security threats. So increasingly we're seeing adversary, adversaries take those societal vulnerabilities like corruption or, or weak media or breaches in the rule of law and its application and use those against the alliance to undermine political cohesion. I would be really interested in your ideas about how NATO can and should address democratic backsliding among members and whether, for example, Greece would support some type of democracy or political cohesion ple pledge at the summit or in the strategic concept. I believe that's something that, that the French are, are pushing within the alliance. Um, and then secondly, you know, at the outset, you spoke about tensions between Greece and Turkey and the Eastern Med. And we have seen a return to the table um, with, with the Secretary General intervening to try to get everybody at least speaking again. Is there more that you think NATO could be doing um, to reduce tension in the Eastern Med and perhaps even uh, go a step further in helping to resolve some of the, the underlying issues in the region? Thanks very much. Mm. Those are very interesting questions, but I'll try to tackle as best I can. Now, with respect to the democratic uh, uh, backsliding among NATO members, um, my first uh, uh, comment is that we should not forget that NATO was devised as a military alliance and now needs to reinvent itself in order to address uh, new security challenges and more complex situations that constitute such security threats and challenges uh, 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 in these days. Now, it's true that not all partners and allies abide by international law or the democratic process uh, and still constitute NATO allies. We, ha we have to find a way, however, to uh, reach a consensus. And in my mind, this is a highly political process. In that respect, I think we should engage with the uh, uh, NATO committee more in order to uh, uh, do all the necessary consultations that uh, would restore actually political unity. Uh, as you can see, the main threat to NATO's internal cohesion comes from the strains between Turkey and other allies. I wouldn't want to include just Greece in that. We all saw what happened in the summer uh, off the coast of Libya with a, between a, a, a Turkish and, and a French naval vessel. That resulted into France's withdrawing from a NATO initiative uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the Eastern Med region. And that is a blow to NATO's internal cohesion that is not attributed to the tension between Greece and Turkey, but I would say to this overall conduct that I uh, tried to explain uh, before. Now, 
I do believe that in this coming summit, we could, NATO could adopt the so-called um, consultation pledge uh, that could be modeled on the defense investment pledge by which allies would undertake the commitment to proceed to prior consultations with other allies before taking critical decisions, uh, decisions that could reflect on NATO's uh, security. Also, uh, they could consult with each other in order to respect the principles and values of the alliance, which are very clear cut. And that is a political process should be undertaken by all the leaders concerned. But that, I think, is the only way to reach uh, 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 some type of solution and uh, and deal and deal with uh, democratic backsliding and ultimately a, a status of respecting um, uh, uh, the existing rules of contact between uh, uh, international actors, which is uh, nothing less than international law. And, and I believe that would be a, a good start for all. Now, the new strategic concept would also be a step in the right direction. Um, that strategic concept should stay, take into consideration every partner's um, uh, security uh, um, concerns, uh, what each partner co constitutes a threat or a, or a challenge in its security uh, in this emerging strategic environment. Um, also, we should also take stock of the dramatic changes on the periphery of the alliance, especially from east to west, uh, because, you know, according to the traditional NATO structure, uh, the Soviet Union beforehand and Russia now is a given, I would say, uh, 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 security threat. It is a certain given magnitude. It's not the case to our east. There's a lot of fluidity. Uh, there's a lot of changes on our eastern periphery, and we should take stock of that. We should try to uh, quantify that. We should try to uh, 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 identify all those uh, threats and challenges that are not always directly, directly military threats and challenges. They have hybrid, hybrid elements, for example, asymmetric threat elements like the um, uh, uh, uncontrollable migration flows, which could include elements, terrorist elements within those migration flows, as I had the opportunity to point out to our NATO partners back in November when we met in in Brussels, yet another um, destabilizing and menacing parameter in migration flows. So in this renewed and, 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 and fluid context, I think NATO should take all the necessary steps in order to identify the challenges uh, and address them, both in its interior, internal structure, as well as on the periphery. Thank you. And, and to the second question, which I think you touched on, but, but just to make sure I didn't miss anything, do you yeah. think that NATO should be doing more uh, to, to mitigate the, the challenges in the Eastern Med? Well, yes, I, I, I need to uh, comment on that as well. Well, I, we, we certainly welcome uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg's initiative to uh, uh, devise this deconfliction mechanism. Uh, however, we should all uh, acknowledge the fact that there's a limit to all that as well. I mean, I respect and I appreciate the 24 hour uh, hotline between the uh, uh, command centers on, on, uh, on, 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 on both sides, uh, uh, our, our chief of defenses and the Turkish chief of defenses command centers in order to have this open channel of communication. However, I, we should also uh, uh, bear into consideration that this is a hotline and a deconfliction, a dialogue process that takes place between uh, military staff, between the two sides. And the overall existing differences are uh, entirely political differences that should be resolved on the diplomatic front first and foremost, which is more of a political diplomatic process. In that respect, I believe that the deconfliction process within the NATO framework is a great step in the right However, uh, ultimately, this is a, a series of diplomatic differences that should be resolved in the uh, uh, right channel. I, I should, however, remind you that, that uh, um, uh, at one point, it was uh, uh, Secretary Stoltenberg himself who said that, for example, during the summer 
uh, escalating tensions that, uh, that, the, that we would achieve a de-escalation if all vessels concerned should leave the premises and thus de-escalate uh, the situation in the uh, uh, southeastern Aegean or the eastern Med waters. So uh, what needs to be done is before us, we have to engage, uh, we have to uh, uh, exert a lot of effort in that, try to reach an understanding, but then again, play by the rules at all times. Mr. Minister, thank you so much. In the minutes that we have remaining, I'd like to turn the conversation now to your perfect intro introductory remarks into it, into strategic competition. You mentioned hybrid warfare. Greece has been a victim of, of Russian uh, hybrid tactics, particularly in the North surrounding the referendum uh, related to uh, North Macedonia, which is a major leap forward in stabilizing the region in the Western Balkans, you've had to expel uh, diplomats. We know China uh, is also uh, economically engaged in Greece. Um, Greece is a member of the 17 plus one uh, forum. We know the Costco shipping company owns 51% of the port of Piraeus. So there are questions about the resilience of NATO members when you think about strategic competition and influence. So I'd welcome your thoughts on that. And we had a Great question from our audience. You know, what are the uh, concerns that you have as we see Sino-Russian collaboration increasing economically as well as militarily? I think there was several years ago, there was actually a, a Sino-Russian naval exercise in the Eastern Mediterranean. So would welcome your thoughts on separately the strategic competitors and your thoughts on as they continue to combine some of their energies together. Well, First of all, I'd like to separate, uh, I would say, the, 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 the Russian attempt to exert influence in this part of the world from the Chinese attempt. Uh, I would say that Russia, traditionally, historically, has always sought a presence in the warmer waters of the uh, Mediterranean and the Aegean Sea, uh, through the Black Sea, of course. Uh, so it's always been there in, in, in one way or another. Uh, I would also say that argue that this part of the world is relatively close to Russia's vital geopolitical interests. The fact that it has tried to exert its expanded influence in the Balkans or the Belt of Western Balkans is, is a different story. And in that respect, NATO's, um, I would say, uh, 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 successful attempt to expand itself into those countries uh, uh, has negated uh, uh, the, the Russian objective to uh, uh, continue to exert its influence in the Balkans like it has used to in the days of the Soviet Union. Um, however, China is a different story. Uh, China, I would say, uh, looks at itself increasingly as a rising superpower, a rising superpower that probably is met uh, with, with, with uh, uh, not, not certainly not contempt, but a certain uh, a negative attitude by the Iranian superpower, which is none other than the United States of America. China feels that it has a role to uh, uh, assume in, in, in world order and tries very systematically to expand itself by exer exerting soft power first. However, as we've seen recently, it has always, uh, 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 now it has recently started asserting itself as a hard power, hard world power in terms of hard power as well, as we've seen with recent developments in its uh, 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 growing military and defense structure. In these parts of the world, China has chosen the path of conducting itself as a soft power. For example, it has uh, elected to invest in a series of ports as gateways to Europe, in order to uh, expand uh, on its trade relationship with the European Union. Uh, I must say that the trade relationship between China and Europe is strong and an existing one. No one doubts about it. Uh, it chose to invest in uh, the vital port of Piraeus, vital for the Southeastern European trade routes in times when nobody else elected to invest in such a uh, 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 an infrastructure project and 
thereby Greece had no alternative but to uh, actually accept Chinese investment. Um, it has consolidated its presence in securing, let's say, a gateway, a trade gateway into Southeastern Europe, but uh, uh, nothing beyond that in terms of investing in infrastructure in Greece. Now, I had the opportunity to uh, communicate that to my Chinese counterpart when he visited with us uh, about two months ago, that uh, uh, Greece sees itself as an established member of a certain camp, and that is the Western camp. Uh, at the same time, we feel very concerned about the escalating tension between the United States and China. And I believe this tension should never uh, go beyond a certain point where some type of military engagement is, uh, is, is under consideration. That would be disastrous, probably for world peace. However, I think that uh, in order for a, a certain uh, type of modus vivendi to be uh, established, I think that uh, China needs to understand that the United States is their reigning superpower with its own vital interests at stake, its own vital interests uh, that will be protected by a reigning superpower, as is the norm, and also that the United States should understand that China looks at itself as an up-and-coming world power and seek to establish its own role in the world. My wish is that, you know, all that uh, there is room for, uh, uh, I would say, uh, 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 all types of existing powers of various magnitudes in the world. However, there should also be a modus vivendi and a very, let's say, established set of uh, values that the Western world cannot uh, distance itself from. And that should be respected by everybody. <clears throat> Mr. Minister, I think you put your finger on, on the challenge set, particularly as we look at China. Can that relationship be managed that you can do both? Uh, welcome that economic investment in uh, while there are uh, other series of behaviors um, that work against the very values that, that you uh, have, have mentioned. And I think this is the greatest challenge as NATO, as it looks towards its strategic concept, is going to be thinking more about China uh, and I think in some ways, Greece has a powerful voice in that that can also sh share the dangers in some ways um, that some of that economic investment it comes with, with great strings attached. So I think that is a conversation that we will look forward to having with you in the future. This has been a great conversation. We've really covered uh, the landscape of the challenges. Uh, this is a, a, a region of incredible importance, uh, not only to NATO's southeast flank, but as you mentioned, of global interest. Mr. Minister, I know we have to let you go, so you can go to Parliament where you're going to be uh, having the rest of your busy day. Uh, but this has been fantastic. Thank you for, for sharing your insights. Uh, again, on behalf of Rachel and myself and CSIS, we thank you for joining us. We thank our audience for joining us. Please, Mr. Minister, have the last word. Let me say, first of all, that I regret having to disengage because of uh, um, uh, parliamentary obligations. It's been a, an extremely um, uh, interesting and, and uh, thought-provoking convers conversation, which uh, I really enjoyed. It's really hard to elaborate on all those uh, fluent dynamics in, uh, in uh, uh, geopolitics on a regional level, but on a wider level as well, with, with all that type of emerging strategic competition I did my best to provide, let's say, a basic framework. Um, there's a lot more to be discussed, of course, but I, 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 I would hope for, uh, for a future opportunity and I'll be glad to, uh, to rejoin you and, and discuss more on, uh, on what's happening in this uh, part of the world and, and beyond. It's been a joy and, and, and once more, I thank you so much for this opportunity. We will take you up on that kind offer, future offer. Thank you. Rachel, let me turn it over to you to, to close us out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Minister. That was a really enjoyable conversation. And you certainly underscored for our audience the strategic importance of the greater Mediterranean uh, as, as you identified it in addressing all of these challenges. So we continue to, to look forward to pushing the conversation forward with you, whether it's at NATO, bilaterally or together with EU partners. So thank you again for your time and, and good luck this afternoon.
Thank you. I'll need that. 